Hello and welcome to our next stop on this tour of the, of the virtual tour of our painted churches. Today we are in St. Hedwig, Texas, a small Polish community just outside of 1604, outside of San Antonio. This parish named the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary is the next stop. It is a beautiful location, Polish in heritage. Today I will not be leading our tour. I will be inviting one of the deacons from here at the church to come out and give us a little bit of tour and background of the church. I do want to invite him into the video with us. This is Deacon Mike Drum. He is a parishioner here in St. Hedwig who will be helping guide us in this tour. And Deacon, how long have you been a deacon? Uh, since 2016. Since so 2016. So you're still a little bit of a baby deacon to some degree. I am. I am. I am the junior deacon of this church. Okay. And who is the other deacon we have here? Uh, Dick, Dick Coronado, who's, uh, who's a couple of years senior to me. Very capable, a wonderful man. Awesome. We're awesome. Very blessed to have him. So what is one of your favorite things that you've enjoyed most about being a deacon in general? Um, the ministry, service to the, to the parishioners. I thoroughly mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Um, I was at St. Anne's for my first two years after I ordination, and then at my request, I was transferred here back to my home parish. Nice. Uh, but I very much, very much enjoyed the ministry. I feel very blessed and honored to be able to serve the people of this community. Well, that's awesome. How long have you and your family been a part of the Annunciation Parish? still a very predominant farming community. Oh, farming and ranching, yeah. A lot of ranching. We get a lot of uh, people mm -hmm. that herd cattle here. And uh, then, you know, we have folks like me that are outsiders, but it's been really accepted. Yeah. And, uh, I, have, I have Polish blood, so I have a meaningful dialogue, not so much. <laughs> uh, but yeah. that's about it. Um, but uh, this, the people, the parish, the parish, is awesome. Well, at this time, I do want to invite everyone as we get ready to move forward into our tour, as we get ready to go and walk to our next location, join us on this beautiful tour of this beautiful parish. It is just a few minutes outside of 1604, right outside of San Antonio. One of the most beautiful features about this Totus Tuus cross is what it means. John Paul II used this phrase, which was used kind of the way we use the word sincerely whenever we write letters in our modern society as a way to sign off a letter, which technically it translates totus tuus, means totally yours, or it, I, I'm all yours. And John Paul II used this quote, this phrase, in commemoration of a Marian consecration he did. Many of you may remember he had a deep devotion to the Blessed Mother, both Our Lady of Sestahova for his Polish heritage but also to Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. Yep. He actually, when his trip to Mexico, referred to himself as a Guadalupano, a follower of Our Lady, a, a believer of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And totus tuus was a way to remind himself and commemorate that Marian consecration that he made in his priesthood and his time as Pope, and to commemorate that and give honor to that consecration throughout all of his papacy. At this time, let us continue on. We will now go into the church to begin our tour of this wonderfully beautiful church. Join with me, let us walk now. So I do want to say welcome to everybody into Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary Church here in St. Hedwig. As I mentioned before, maybe for some of y'all, you didn't realize what we actually have right outside of our, in our church. This is right outside of 1604. It is a 20-minute drive, maybe, for many of you to come out to visit, to pray in this beautiful church. And so at this time, I am going to go ahead and step off camera to allow Deacon to begin leading us in this beautiful tour. But I do pass it over to you. Deacon, thank you for, volunteer, for being willing to tour us and give us a little of the story of your church, as this, I know, is very close to your heart. It is, Father. Thank you. Well, as you can see, there's a lot of wonderful icons, decorations, statues in here. 
We have statues around the entire circumference of the church, a lot of them associated with the saints of our heritage here, our Polish heritage. St. Hedwig, who is on that statue over there. Uh, we have St. Michael and St. Francis, St. Anthony, of course, because of San Antonio. And Our Lady of Guadalupe in a large painting over the, uh, the parish uh, assembly here next to the uh, choir loft. The uh, parish pews were replaced a few years back and uh, they're now in very good shape. We have um, stained glass, uh, some of it very old. The older ones uh, are in the most protected parts of the church because the original ones were probably damaged in hail storms and that kind of thing. And we can show you some of the, uh, the original uh, stained glass windows. There's a bunch over here closer to the front of the church, uh, to the altar. This, um, this particular backdrop for the altar was painted by a Polish priest who was here, oh, a couple of years ago to restore it and renovate it. And he <clears throat> unfortunately passed away last year. So any restoration in the future will have to come from someone else. You can see the, the old ambo over here where the risen Christ, a statue to our Blessed Virgin, who we've uh, uh, spoke highly of yesterday <laughs> during the mass because of Mother's Day and her as an example of mothers everywhere. So we have Our Lady of Guadalupe and a painting of Juan Diego that was donated to the church. Um, and over here is the Divine Mercy, the image created by St. Faustina, given to her by our, our, uh, our Lord Jesus. And there's a painting of her that was also donated to the church. The picture of, on the mural behind the altar here, that has St. John Paul II in it was uh, added uh, a couple of years ago after he was canonized. All right, so the basement is through that. Our parish church also has a basement, usually something unheard of here in Texas, but it had a very practical purpose at the time. It was shelter from storms, but also in the early years when this church was first built, people would hide in there. Ranchers and farmers in the surrounding area would hear the church bells and come here to be secure from passing bandits, Comancheros, and uh, even passing bands of Comanches. Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary Catholic Church became a part of this community in around the mid 1800s, the city itself was originally called Saint, uh, it was called Martinez and was changed in 1868 to St. Hedwig. And then the first building that was used as a parish or as a church for the parish was about a mile northwest of here, and which is a lot closer to the town of Martinez. This particular building was built in uh, around 1924 uh, because the population of the parish had grown to over 1,400 people. So there was a desperate need for a much larger building. We'd gone through a couple of other structures, more or less temporary, between the one outside of uh, Martinez, outside of here, and this building. The next place that you would want to try to make a stop to visit a little bit if you came out to St. Hedwig to visit the beautiful church is to also come into here. The St. John Paul II Center here at the church. This serves as both their parish offices, but also as a small museum in it, commemorating the visit of John Paul II. And I know, Deacon, you were telling me something very interesting about the lettering and the naming on the building. Right. When this was originally put on the building to uh, commemorate it to uh, Pope John Paul II, the name was offset just a little bit to the right to make room for it to be centered when the addition of ST period was put on there in anticipation of him becoming canonized. It's a very big blessing to have him as our patron of this center. And so now we will go ahead and walk to enter into, and we'll continue to my right here, and we continue into the hall to see some of these nice, beautiful pieces of works that are kind of just to <laughs> use to remember a little bit the visit of John Paul II to San Antonio and this Polish heritage that we have.
And this, of course, is our um, assembly hall where we have our annual, uh, among other things, what we call a vigilia, which is the Christmas party. It's always on a Friday before Christmas. And of course, we don't eat meat, but we have uh, a wonderful fish and a Polish mushroom soup that is unbelievable. So inside of this parish hall, this beautiful office building area that the space the church has, you find two very important items, two very important relics that are significant to the history of our archdiocese, but especially to those of us of Polish heritage. Back when we were in Panama Maria, we mentioned how John Paul II came to San Antonio to do a papal visit. He visited with the people of Panama Maria, but they weren't the only ones of Polish heritage that came to visit. Deacon Mike even told me that he actually worked the event, was there with his wife. And I don't know if you would like to mention a little bit, Deacon, about your time and what your thoughts were. You had mentioned you were an usher, I believe you said? That's correct. I'd just come back from Germany after a tour there. And mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I were signed up by my sister. We didn't know about it, but we were very glad that she did it. Mm -hmm. And what we were able to do was be in the crowd, not too far from uh, the altar where he was saying mass. And we got to see him. I took pictures. I didn't get too close but it was a very moving event. Uh, it was very hot and dry at the time, mm -hmm. and it's now a housing area, but it's, uh, it was a wonderful experience. We got to see him sitting on this throne, and the fact that it's a part of this parish now just makes us feel so much more a part of this community. It's a real blessing. Yeah, so for those that are wondering, this is one of the main papal thrones that was used by John Paul II during his visit to the area to San Antonio. It was designed by a group of brothers. They were, they were the Salas brothers here in San Antonio. And it was the heaviest piece of furniture used during the papal mass. It is said that it required 10 men to be able to move it. And at a certain point, all that remains of the equipment of stuff between this, between this chair, the podium here right next to me, and the altar. Do you all know where the altar is at? No, Father. So I'd have to Father. ask at the archdiocese where the altar was, is at located. But only those three pieces actually remain. Everything else was actually carried off by souvenir hunters and others looking for something to commemorate their visit or their time that they're hoping possibly would be worth money one day or that they could pass down. Even to the point that this chair had cushions on it at one point. They even took the cushions to be able to try to commemorate or keep a memory of, that, of this visit. But these chairs are very important to the archdiocese. What's interesting in the entire story, and if you get the chance, you can read the entire story on this plaque on the chair. But it mentions that at one point, the chair, the altar, were, and the podium were seized by the IRS. Because of the company that made them, they defaulted on tax payments. And so the government seized these items for due to lack of payment. But then donated them back to the chancery in the archdiocese because they were not of any value to, the, to the, uh, the government, which is a blessing, I think, in our case, because while they were not of any value to the government, they are of extreme value to all of us in our faith, in our culture, in our journey. Amen. One of the great parts of the history of this parish is that from its very founding, even until now, it has been a farming and ranching community of people that lived and moved and have made their livelihood by working with the land. And the patron saint for all of those who do that style of work is St. Isidore, which is a statue that we have here outside of the church. St. Isidore was known from being in Spain and had a beautiful devotion to working with the land and his farm life. I can let you all look up his story if you so want. But he is also the patron saint for all of those who are praying for rain. In our modern time right now, we are begging for rain in our society. And so St. Isidore is one of those saints we can beg the intercession of to ask our Lord to send rain upon us. But he is also a saint that has many, many people that have a devotion to him here in this community, as it still is a community even to this day that is deeply founded and rooted in a farming and ranching lifestyle and a connection to the livelihood of the work of working the land around us.
So one of my favorite things to talk about whenever we come into any church is to look a little bit at the architecture, to look at the way the churches were built, because it tells us a little bit about our history, about our faith, and about an understanding of how we connect and worship to God. So Annunciation as a church, as you can see, I wanted to get a really close look where we can look into the church and really get a way to value, to, to be able to see the beauty of all of these peaks. It is a very Gothic style of design. As you can see in the video, it is a baby blue color. That baby blue, the church uses color to also signify things. And baby blue, as you might already have been guessing, is a color that is used to designate devotion to our Blessed Mother, which makes sense in that this church is actually devoted to the Annunciation of our Blessed Mother. One of the more interesting things that we're going to be able to try to pan to allow you to be able to see is that these peaks and the interior roofing of this church are made in a very old style that you do not usually see anymore in that it is pressed tin. And so what they did is they took tin and laid it over a form and then put pressure on it to stick the indentions that were then painted. So if you're able to look very closely, you will see that in the blue and in the white, you will see a design that was pressed into tin that isn't a design just of paint, but it is a design that is actually forced into the mold of what it is that makes the interior of this church. The thing we have to remember is our churches are designed specifically and poignantly to focus us, that it's not just a place we come to worship God. Those are found anyway. But when we build God a house, a sanctuary, as these series is called, they are meant to call us to a mind to a bigger understanding of God. And many of our churches, the idea behind it is to elevate us, to lift us from the mundane, the regular stuff that we're used to on a regular basis, to elevate our hearts, our minds, our souls, and lift us toward God. And so that is what the design of this church is really all about. The high peaks, the high ceilings, all of these things are meant to guide us and point us to a very specific reality that, of God as height, to elevate us, to bring us to greater depths, greater heights in our own worship. Here we are standing as well in the choir loft of Annunciation Church. Some parishes nowadays, a choir loft doesn't really fit with the modern architecture. But the choir loft allowed a couple of different things for a church. First off, a choir loft allowed the voices to carry farther out into the church because of the way they were elevated and allows them to be played through the roofing and bounce a little bit and move. So it allowed that sound, but also it gave a mindset. It gave us a thing to imagine. The idea behind the choir loft was the choirs of angels as they sing. And so the voices are meant to carry over the people to remind them that you are a part of the divine liturgy of God. An action that is taking place at the altar that doesn't just incorporate us, but all the saints, all the angels. And all of this is shown to us and guided for us in the architecture and the way we build our church. One of the things also we can recognize are the chandeliers that go down the center of the church. These chandeliers were meant to give a more antique kind of feel to the church, but also to connect it to its older history and European history. That history is represented and shown through these beautiful chandeliers that give light, but also give a different ambiance, a different way of seeing and feeling the church as we enter into it today. So as we were talking about the architecture, I wanted to invite Deacon back in with us again, because while I can talk about everything about how these different aspects of this church affect the worship and the way we respond to it, I think it's best to get a personal reaction. So I do want to ask Deacon a little bit about what I talked about with the architecture and how you see it as affecting the worship of the community here. In my impression, uh, in this church, in this parish, this, this church is extraordinary when you come for Mass. It's, it's not ordinary. It's uh, the, all of the things that Father described about the architecture, the icons, the decoration, set a climate uh, and as you said, an ambiance, but ambiance is so short of reverence. It's so easy to come in here and fall on your knees. 
it's the kind of place that people are attracted to because they know they'll be close to God. And I love it. Amen. One of the other things that I want to emphasize, not only here at St. Hedwig at Annunciation, but also I could have emphasized it in Panna Maria and many of these rural parishes that are going to be done in this tour, is that, a, that many of these parishes have a very deep connection to vocations. Vocations to religious life as well as vocations to the priesthood. There is something about the worship in these communities, the way we connect to God that inspires and brings people not only to a deeper reverence, as Deacon talked about, but a desire to serve God and to serve Him in a very specific way. Here in St. Hedwig at Annunciation, as far as we know, there is one ordained priest from its history, as well as one seminarian actively studying for the Archdiocese of San Antonio. The priest is Father Platt, who is actually a priest in the Diocese of New Jersey. And actively studying for our Archdiocese is Steve Fitzsimon. This is his home parish. Many of our parishes have posters where we show all of our seminarians to give us a face to represent to a name that we pray for vocations and pray for specific seminarians to at least be able to recognize who they are. But many of these per parishes, when we have a vocation from them, it takes on a different meaning when we pray for vocations. Because we're not praying broadly for God send us someone to be a priest. Whenever we have a seminarian from a location, it takes on a personal idea. Yes, God, please send us a priest. But we also pray specifically for the one from our community that we watched grow and become the young man that entered the seminary and that we look forward to celebrating with as a priest. I know when I was in Panna Maria growing up, it was a great sense of pride for the entire community. And it actually became one of their greatest sources of pride to talk about me going to become a priest and then me actually being ordained. It was one of the biggest celebrations in Panna Maria when I was able to come back and celebrate my first mass. And I can only imagine the joy and how it will be in a few years. I don't know exactly how far Steve is in his formation, but to have him be able to come back to the community that formed him to celebrate that first mass and to celebrate with them for who made him who he was and to help make him the priest that God willing he will be able to come become. So I do want to invite you, pray for vocations, pray for more priests. These rural parishes have always carried a large share of promoting vocations. But our diocese is enormous. From corner to corner, it is three hours wide to drive across our diocese. It encompasses over 170 parishes. Let us pray that God will call many people in to serve as priests, but also as nuns, as much as we talk about how priest is in the shortage. Religious life as sisters and nuns is in even as much more a dire need for those who are willing to give their lives in devotion to God as sisters, as nuns, to give and be that loving embrace and arm of the church. So I invite you as you pray for more priests, pray for sisters and nuns, and never be uncomfortable talking about vocations to your family, to your children, your grandchildren, to the young people in your parish. The one thing often I hear is, you know, I talk to old timers and they're from parishes. So, you know, I thought about becoming a priest or becoming a sister, but no one ever talked to me about it. No one ever asked me about it, so I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if it was just something I was thinking about. So talk to those people in your parishes. The altar server that is very reverent and loving in Mass, tell him that he would make a good priest. You never know the impact that those seeds that you plant could do in regard to being the next priests that serve our archdiocese for many, many years to come.